Okay, so I'll take you through what, what the plan is for the course today. It's going to be about an hour of talking and then, I don't know, 20 minutes of questions or, or whatever really. So I'm going to take you through a bit about what a spider is, its morphology, its livestock, life cycles and that, so you're familiar with what spiders are really. Uh, I'll then take you through some very common spiders, so take you through some pictures of ones that you're likely to see. Nothing rare here, uh, there's no point showing rarities that you see once in a blue moon, so they're all things that you're very likely to see in your, in your back gardens. And then as, as Roy said we'll have a bit of a question and answer session at the end so we'll probably go through the chat questions that people pose through the course first and then we'll throw it open to an open mic session and then people can pose more in-depth questions or or what have you it's often easier just to ask them over a, a live mic I think sometimes rather than typing long questions right Okay, so I'm pretty sure that most of you know what a spider is, but I'll just take you through a few terms. They're, they're roughly equivalent to what an insect terminology is, or you'll, you'll notice some of the terms are even applicable to mammals. So it's not sort of, from an evolutionary point of view, they're not analogous features. They're, they're structural, really. It's a leg is a leg. <laughs> you see what I mean? Right, so the carapace, that's... That's this shield shaped covering on the head really. So it's it's where the eyes are. So you can see they've got the eight eyes here clustered. You can probably only make out four there. But they're, they're always at the front of the carapace there, pointing forward. Uh, the carapace, under here you've got the, the, the brain, uh, the sucking stomach as well. So. Spiders are strange in that they only take in liquid food. So they disgorge enzymes onto the, the prey that they've captured and then they're sucking up the liquid into their sucking stomach. I'll talk more about that later. Then the abdomen, that, because it's an invertebrate, essentially it's a suit of armour. They've got exoskeletons, so all the legs, the carapace, the rigid, solid, structures that can't flex really but the abdomen is essentially a balloon so it can contract and expand depending on how well fed the spider is so you'll see some spiders with really scrawny abdomens if they have a big feed or if they're gravid females that abdomen can expand considerably so in the abdomen there's the heart and they have an interesting blood circulation system so they have a, a sort of semi-open blood system, unlike our closed system. So they, they have a sort of aortary type heart there that pumps the blood around. And interesting, the, the blood is used for sort of hydraulic action of some of the le legs as well. So it's not just a case that it's used for oxygen and nutrient transport. It's actually used for extending some of the leg segments so most of them are controlled by muscles within the legs but there are some which work by hydraulics and then legs we n conventionally number them from the front right to the back so if people talk about a feature on leg one that's the front leg leg four is obviously the rear leg right so there's a, a little jumping spider I, most spiders are nocturnal, I would say. You, you do get a few that are diurnal, day active species. And this is one of those day active species. So you can see it's got these really massive eyes at the front there. It's an active hunter in it. This is a, one of the jumping spiders. So it doesn't use a web to capture prey at all. It, it relies on visual stimuli to see a prey item. And then it will either pounce on it or it'll grab it as it walks past. Uh, you can see these chelicerae at the front. These are sort of articulated mouth part sections and attached to the chelicerae are fangs so you can just about make them out the sharp little articulated fangs which are like hypodermic needles I suppose. They're, they've got a hollow channel down them and a hole at the end 
So the venom gland is within the chalicerae and that will be squeezed and then the venom will come down the hypodermic needle with a fang into the prey. And they're using that to subdue large prey items because some spiders can take down prey items many times their own size. So it just stops the prey thrashing around and potentially damaging the spider. Because they are actually quite fragile. They have very limited capacity to clot their own blood. So if they're damaged, they, they can bleed out quite easily. So quite fragile things really. And then we've got the palp. Now that, that's a bit confusing because it looks like a little leg. And often if you see some of the transfer spiders, you think, oh, that seems to have 10 legs rather than eight. It's supposed to be a spider. Well, it has one segment fewer than a leg. So you see it's generally small. And in most of our British spiders, they're very small and you probably won't even notice them. But they're used for scooping prey items towards the, the fangs. Uh, and in the males, they're particularly important for mating, which I'll go into in a session in uh, a minute. Right, so I've told you about the, the sort of exoskeleton. It's this rigid suit of armour, if you wish. And like snakes, they have to shed their skin if they're going to grow. So every time they grow, they shed the skin and then while they're soft, a bit like a soft shelled crab, if any of you are fishermen or fisherwomen. So you'll see that this is an exoskeleton. So you might see these hanging up in sheds in old webs. And you can see it's, it's just a hollow shell of a spider, really. And quite interesting. They shed pretty much everything, even the, the lenses of their eyes. Uh, inside of their sucking stomach so it's all replaced and renewed so anything that's hard and sort of non-flexible gets shed and you can see that they're, they're the leg joints there undersides the sort of articulated membranes there so a little bit closer and you can see on this house spider we've got the palp that's been shed and just notice how swollen it is it's not like a typical leg segment which is sort of very smooth this is sort of bulb shaped onion shaped pear shaped and that's signifying that it's a, a subadult male so what's happened in there is that that's sort of expanded to accommodate the the, the palpal bulbs that are developing in there so on the final molt uh, they'll molt and then this complicated structure of the palpal bulb will be shown and i'll show you a picture of that so that's a male spider and you can see here this really complex structure on the end of the palp. And if you think about uh, the way spiders mate, what they do, they don't mate like most species do. So most spiders are male and female. Uh, I think there's one or two that are parthenogenic for uh, females, but they're very rare. So a male spider has these complicated structures on the palps which are effectively eye droppers for transferring sperm into the female so what he does he creates a little silk web and he deposits a piece of sperm and drop of sperm onto the web uh, and then he'll use these eye dropper palps to sort of dab into the droplet of sperm to charge them up so once they're filled with sperm he can then use those palps to transfer to the female and that's sort of a bit of a lock and key mechanism so there's your palp so there's a palp there's a, a dead dissected spider and you can see this complicated structure on the end of the palp which i've removed here just to show you and I can probably just about make out there's a sort of ducting system within there it's like a, a coil coiled uh, tube within which accommodates the sperm and then it comes out under hydro hydraulic pressure so yes that's a very useful feature for identifying spiders because the, the palp bulb can be very structurally different the em embolus which is the, the long bit which actually enters the female that's often very characteristically shaped and you can use that to identify different spiders so what does a female palp look like well there you go you see it's not developed in any way it just looks for, for all intents and purposes like a 
the end of a normal leg. So it's not structurally developed at all. And yeah, big house spider that you're probably all familiar with that you get in your baths. Now, I told you about the, the female genitalia that they have this interesting structure called an epigyne. Well, most British spiders do, in fact. Some don't, but we won't go into them. And you can see how structurally complex it is. It's on the underside of the abdomen. So this is a spider hanging upside down in, in her web like that. And you can see on the underside of the abdomen, there's this little dark patch. Now, that's the epigyne. And think of it as a, a lock, essentially, in the male pump being the key. It's one will only fit the appropriate species. So it, it's a sort of species barrier, really. And it makes identification quite nice because they are structurally different and sometimes radically so. And you can get quite familiar with the interesting intricate structures. So we've got two very superficially similar spiders. These are island eaters there. If you look on gorse bushes in from about now onwards, you might see a little web with a silken, almost like a diving bell, I suppose like a little silk web and a very tangled messy web and in there you'll find this little globulous spider that's very mottled. Now there's actually two species that look almost the same dorsally so on the top you'd think of the same thing but underneath the epigyne is slightly different so it's probably difficult to appreciate on this magnification but you can see that's a just a round circle that's more of a sort of figure of eight shape. So it's that subtlety that you're appreciating. In this species, interestingly, the abdomen underside has a different coloration. So you can separate them on other features as well. But for a clinching ID, you need to look at the genitalia. Right, so spider egg sacs. Spiders are mated, and now the female wants to produce an egg sac. And this is one of the main reasons they make silk actually. It's, all spiders will pretty much use silk for protecting their egg sac. So this is a little money spider, perhaps a millimetre and a, millimeter and a half long. You can actually see an old shed skin there. And this is her egg sac and you can see how huge it is compared to the spider. And within there there'll be I don't know, up to a hundred eggs, depending on the species, little spherical embryos, I suppose. And she's covered them in different layers of silk. So it won't be just one type of silk. It'll be several different types of silk from different silk glands. So there'll be a, a woolly protective layer around the eggs. Then there'll be a more densely packed layer of different silk, it's probably water repellent. And all that's just to stop other invertebrates attacking the eggs. Obviously, they're very protein rich, easy, easy to eat. Not all spiders will guard egg sacs, so many spiders will lay their egg sac and just leave it. There are exceptions. Right, so some spiders will actually carry their own egg sac around with them. So that spider I showed you earlier produces a little web and captures prey directly. Now, this one here is an active hunting wolf spider. So she doesn't make a web to capture prey. She either sits and waits for passing prey and then grabs them or she'll walk around and encounter prey. So she doesn't use a web to ensnare prey. So she has to carry her egg sac around. So you see these little white egg sacs carried on the spinnerets the, at the rear end of the abdomen. And when that egg sac hatches, all the young will cluster on the female's back and she'll carry them around. So it's quite high levels of maternal care, really. And that phylonita I showed you earlier, she'll actually feed her young like a bird will. So she'll regurgitate food and the young will cluster around the mouth and take sort of regurgitated prey items. So, yeah, quite interesting behaviour for a spider and quite unexpected for something that you think is a sort of instinctive predator. It's, there's a lot more to them than meets the eye, really. And then 
this is our Fenraff spider. This is one of Britain's rarest spiders. It's one of only two that's got full protection. So it's quite a big thing really, probably getting on for about an inch body length. Uh, very impressive thing that sits on water surface like this and eats animals that have fallen on the meniscus or can dive under and grab little fish even and eat them, so still backs and the like. This spider does carry its egg back around but in its mouth and then when it's time for the young to emerge she constructs this nursery with this tent and she'll stick the egg sac inside this tent and then the spiderlings will all hatch. So you can see up here there's the cluster of spiderlings they're all hiding and she'll sit on the outside of the web and defend it so to stop parasitic flies uh, parasitic wasps attacking those young and then the spiderlings all eventually just disperse from this web and become little independent free living spiders so she's just giving them a, a sort of good start in life lets them stay there protects them from the weather i suppose to some degree so it's quite interesting maternal care going on there right so sort of a generalized life cycle of a spider so they, they all have a, an egg sac some egg sacs are very rudimentary i'll i'll show you one of those later on so we'll we'll start from the egg sac that hatches spiderlings emerge so little versions of spiders they'll molt and then they'll start become coming free living feeding spiderlings uh, every time they molt they increase in size so they get slightly bigger slightly bigger so they'll go through several molts before they reach maturity and all but one of our british spiders as soon as it's no there's a few more actually sorry that most british spiders will molt and when they they have their maturing molt that's it that's the last molt they'll ever have in their life. That's, that's it. There, there are some that will molt after they mature, like the purse web spider. I think some of the Segestrias do too. So you've got your adults, they'll mate. So this life cycle can be throughout different seasons, which I'll show you in a minute. And then obviously mating and produce eggs. That, so that's a, the scheme. There's no, no larval stage as such. The, it's a very simplified version. It's not like some insects which go through caterpillar stages and the like. Right, I mentioned seasonality. So not all spiders have a sort of standard year cycle. Some will have four year cycles. Most seem to go by a yearly cycle and sometimes the mature maturity period is at different times of the year so in this species here which I think is the common garden spider you'll see that January February you're not going to see them because in the winter they're as an egg sack and then through spring they hatch as spiderlings and then only as they start to become large adults do you start to get records of them and then August September is the peak season and that's when you see the adults and then they've died off as winter kicks in uh, there are other spiders that have the opposite scenario so they're winter maturing largely so you'll have a hard time finding them in high summer they'll they'll be in over winter and they're often the spiders that are under recorded because people don't really feel they want to go out recording in horrible weather on you this year you could do that in july <laughs> So there's other spiders that you can find throughout the year. There's no huge difference. Well, the less, less common say in spring in this species, but every month of the year you can find adults. So there's no one size fits all for the species. They, they all have their slight overlapping generations. So if you look at this one compared to that, is a spring mature. So that's something to bear in mind when you're doing survey work as well. And if you wanted to build up a good species list for your garden or any site for that matter it's worth visiting at different times of the year even if you think you've worked it well you'll probably find new species to that site it's a different time of the year right 
So that's a, a quick whistle-stop tour of what spiders are and what they do. So I think the nice thing is just to take you through a few of the really common things. It will sort of tw twig some memory when you see them next and you go, oh, yes, I've, I've seen that on that, that talk. And you can then look into them a bit more. So I think most people will be familiar with this thing. This is what they call the daddy long leg spider. Now, I know the Arachnological Society has got a, an online survey for this at the moment. So you might want to look into that. Uh, this is a strange spider. It's not actually native. It's one of these that you'll only find indoors. It needs to live at about 10 degrees Celsius and above. So you won't generally find it outside except in maybe very sheltered caves. I have one found it under a motorway sort of bridge where it's obviously quite warm and there was a canal underneath it. So it likes very dry, very warm habitat. So that's why it's moving to live with us really. So any corner of a room will generally have it. It's quite a big thing. It probably gets to about this with legs, but the body is very small. When you disturb them in the webs, they gyrate like this to blur their blur their outline, uh, and they move around on furniture. So they're quite common throughout Britain now. Back in the nineteen fifties, before lots of people had central heat, and these things were comparatively rare. And there was one arachnologist who decided to map them back then, and he would go around B and Bs on a motorcycle. And He'd call in, have a look around the B&B &B and say, I've seen a spider rat, I'll well, note that down, but uh, he'd then make his apologies and leave and say, it's not up to the standard I, I usually stay in. And he'd go on to another B&B &B in the same day and build up a rapid distribution map of these spiders. Probably a little bit unethical really, but yeah, record as a... <laughs> So there it is. Uh, you very rarely see these daddy long leg spiders in that pose, but you can just appreciate as a spider, it's got the two body segments there, unlike harvest men, which are well, a single one. Some people might confuse them with the daddy, daddy long legs, the tipula, the flies. So obviously if it's not got wings, it's probably this thing. There's a closer shot. Very strange spiders really. And they're one that doesn't, they don't produce many silk strands on their egg sac. It's essentially a bag of marbles with just a few strands holding them together. And they hold, hold the egg sac in the mouth as well. Right. So I was telling you how useful silk is for overcoming prey. Well, this species personifies that. So I don't know if you can appreciate this, but th this is actually a another spider this smaller spider is ensnared so this is a woodlouse spider a spider with really strong powerful fangs it can readily bite through human skin yet this daddy long legged spider with little puny fangs that can barely pierce anything has managed to kill and overpower this larger spider and it's it's done that by using silk. So what it does, it, it cards out silk from its abdomen spinnerets using its bat legs and it throws bands of silk over the prey at distance. So the spider is well out of the way. It's the only thing that goes anywhere near the, the prey item are the tips of its feet. And then once it's sufficiently tangled up, it'll then move in and cover it more thoroughly in silk and then deliver a venomous bite. And wait for the thing to die and then liquefy it and suck out the remains. So yeah, so powerful predator. So you can see just how well distributed this is in Britain now. I think you can probably assume this is in most houses, if not every other one. <laughs> but look how under-recorded it is in parts of the UK, certainly Mid Wales, Pennines area. I'm sure if you, you based in some of these blank areas you can easily fill in records for this species and so a lot of the Scottish islands there's not many records either so one to look out for and nice and easy to record there's 
only probably one or two other spiders likely to be confused but they're a lot rarer this is the one that you're going to see almost certainly right another very common spider this one you'll get outside so you might come across this sort of doily like web it's very messy and the structure isn't very nice really it's just like a, a doily for instance a, a bit of lace cast over an area and it's got a slight bluish tinge as well and a sort of fluffy look to it now these are made by these amorobius spiders and what they do they produce this sort of fluffy silk and they've got a special comb on their back leg and there's also a plate on near their spinnerets that exudes silk it's very fine multiple strands and she'll use the back leg to comb this silk into lots of little velcro-y type tufts and unlike many silks this doesn't use a glue to ensnare prey it it's capturing things by tangling them up like velcro really so here's another view of a different one so a large lap fence or an old shed almost certainly you'll see this web on on there you see it's bluish at high magnification you can see this carded out silk it's not a single strand it's really woolly and unusual it's very fine as well some of the tropical species that make this so-called crabellate, crabellate silk it it's so fine it'll actually fuse into the waxy cuticle of insects so there's absolutely no escape it becomes part of the cuticle for, for all intents and purposes so this can remain active as a trapping device for decades long since the spider's gone so quite amazing structure and that's another very common spider there are similar spiders there's, there's only three species in this genus so but similis is generally the one you, that you'll find around human habitation i've only found it once in well once or twice in natural habitats and that's in coastal shingle so it seems to have adopted to a man-made dry rocky warm environment similar to coastal shingle around our houses uh, so yeah you can see plenty of recording opportunities there there is another spider called amorobius ferox it's a lot darker you'll see it's, it doesn't have that motley pattern that similis has velvety black yeah. some people say it's got a skull and crossbones pattern on the abdomen i'm not quite sure i see that but there is some sort of pattern but there's never any sort of reds or browns on it really it's velvety black and you'll find this in very damp areas around houses so if you've got a drain cover if you pull that up chances are there'll be one of these under it in your compost bins it tends to like living in there too and it's slightly bigger than uh, stimulus as well uh, very nice spider really and th these two spiders are interesting in that they take maternal care to the extreme so when the spiderlings are uh, full size they'll actually turn on their mother and consume her so very strange the mother essentially gives herself up for the next generation and the young will cluster around on the female's body and make multiple little bites all over her and suck her dry yeah so if you think you've got children and the hard work think again <laughs> right so this species isn't that well so you see there was obviously somebody in Leicestershire doing a lot of recording and i think he was a an engineer so doing cable work and i guess he was coming across this spider in his day-to-day -day job so you can see if it's that common in leicestershire it's probably that common throughout the rest of britain it's just not encountered so you've got to go looking for this one we've got it in our cellar actually so uh, very damp areas it tends to favor you'll also see these on dwarf conifers as well mainly similis but you'll occasionally get ferox in there so those really dense dwarf conifers you'll get this doily web on there too right so first
easy webs that you just come across. Now, if you want to find some more interesting spiders, you've got to start looking for them. So a good place to look is under plant pots outside. Uh, plenty of invertebrates hiding under there. And one of these that you might come across is this woodlouse spider. So I showed you this species earlier. This was the one that the daddy longleg spider had captured. And you can see how amazing these chelicerae at the front. Interestingly, this species only has six eyes. So most British spiders have eight eyes, but this one has six. And these are specialist woodlouse feeders. So these chelicerae are elongated to allow them to get pinch a woodlouse like that. So one of the fangs will go on the top to secure the woodlouse, and the other one will pierce the soft underside and deliver the venomous bite. These can give uh, quite a bite really to humans, so I wouldn't advise picking them up. It's pretty harmless really. It's, it's like an itchy bite for an hour or so, no, of no consequence really. But quite, quite an un unusual spider, but people have described it as looking like it's got a baked bean for an abdomen, which is probably quite a nice way of remembering it if you see it. And this is a very urban species, uh, coastal again. Uh, I hope you can't hear this lawnmower that next door's has got going. So you'll see North Wales and Northwest England, very coastal. Uh, urban centres like London moved in there, obviously likes quite a nice warm temperature with that heat island effect that you get in cities. So Crocata is the one that you'll generally find in urban settings. Uh, there is a rarer one that's found in the south in coastal environments, Erythrina, but generally that's not found in, in the north really. There's one or two records, but Crocas is the one you, you're going to come across. Right, this one's similar to the woodlouse spider, but it's smaller relative really. It's, it's got six eyes. If you go out at night with a torch on your walls, this thing might be walking around. It's Less than a centimetre leg span, really. Really thin, elongated spider. Uh, Harpactia Holmbergi. Uh, nice looking thing, really. Uh, lives under peeling bark as well. Very dry habitats it favours. And that's also got six eyes like Distra. And you can see, once again, very frequent thing. Used to be thought of as quite rare in the sort of 1930s or so. But I think it's just under recorded. And then another spider that has six eyes are these tube web spiders. So if you look in brickwork, you might come across a sort of silken hole like this with these radial silk strands emanating out of it. And we've got three species of tube web spiders in Britain. So these are all these segestrious. So at night they come out and they zip out of the hole if a prey item triggers one of these trip lines and quite nice looking things really. This is the common one, Segestrius inoculata. You'll get that throughout Britain. Uh, if you live in London or if you're Exeter, South Coast, Southampton area, you get a much larger this Segestria florentina and she's got metallic green chelicerae and she's jet black and quite a formidable predator. She's not native actually, she's coming to Britain, but established around coastal ports. And there's almost one of the commonest spiders in Exeter. There's a house spider, you'll see it everywhere, around light fittings, and it pr produces the same radial pattern in the silk. There's also a rare native species which only lives in coastal cliffs called Segestria bavarica which looks superficially like this common sinoculata, but is more mottled. Uh, this is Segestria sinoculata. Another nice way to find is if you, you've got some dry stone walls and you just lift the rocks on the top, and you'll, you'll find a little tube web sandwiched between the rocks. And if you poke the tube web, you'll, you'll see the spider come out. They're quite nice. So you can see in Snowdonia in the Lake District, I think that's probably how people have recorded it so well down there. But I think every house and garden will have this on the outside. 
Right. I think everybody's familiar with this guy. So September time, you start to see these big house spiders suddenly appear out of nowhere. And every time this happens, the media gets excited and writes these stories saying, oh, spiders are bigger than ever before. Uh, no, they're just the same size as last year, actually. <laughs> it's just that they, they only become noticeable during the breeding season when the adult females come out and start, uh, uh, the adult males start wandering around looking for females and webs to mate them. So quite a nice spider really, big thing, uh, maybe an inch body, very fast moving. It falls into baths because it's coming and looking for moisture. Um, unlike many spiders, it doesn't have a special hairs on the tips of its feet called scopulae. So it, it can't physically climb up smooth surfaces. So jumping spiders do have special hairs that allow them to walk on ceilings, up glass. These guys can't. Uh, it's quite difficult to identify these actually. It's not as straightforward as you'd imagine. The problem is that we've got two almost identical species and they hybridise. So in the west of the country we have Aristogena siva and you can see it's fairly well demarked there. So on the east of the country it's very rare. These are probably sporadic introductions. On the east side of Britain you've got Dwellica which used to be called Gigantia. These used to be called Tegenaria so if you look at the, the new genus name, it's actually an anagram of Tegenaria. So who says taxonomists don't have a sense of humour? And the problem is that, like I say, they hybridise along certain zones. So in North Wales, we have hybrids because people have obviously brought in furniture from this side of Britain with specimens on and they've bred with the cedar and likewise up, up in this area. It seems from the scientists that are studying this that the two species might be collapsing back into a single species in the north but it's more clearly demarked in the south so this is one of those spiders you can't identify externally you've got to look at it down a microscope and even then if you've got a hybrid not too sure. So that, that just shows you some of the bigger spiders are harder to identify than the small ones. Right, so if you're out in your garden and you're doing a bit of weeding, you might come across this guy and this is one of the crab spiders, a very strange looking spiders. They, they, they don't make silk to capture prey either. They just scuttle around and as they scuttle, they look very like crabs. They've got these thick legs and they sort of hug the ground a lot. Uh, got a, weak jaws but they've got these huge raptorial arms which they can grab prey items and hold it so there's one species that you'll see called it i think they call it flower crab spider or something like that miss Uminovartia. and that'll sit on oxide daisies hogweed and it'll it's usually white and it'll be camouflaged against a white flower and then when a fly or a bee or a butterfly lands on that flower the spider grabs it so you can see these sometimes because you've seen a butterfly that doesn't take off a, off a flower and often it'll be because it's attached to a spider. Uh, interesting, in North Wales it's pretty much the northern limit of that misumina flower crab spider. So one to look out for. And you can transfer it onto a yellow flower. So the spider's white on a white flower. Transfer it onto a yellow flower and gradually over a period of a, a few days it'll change colour to a yellow flower so it'll become camouflage and quite how they do that who knows obviously can perceive some sort of colour. Right, very common garden spider. Right, so these two are what we call false widow spiders so these also hit the news these are the ones that close schools down and cause a lot of excitement and probably excessive excitement really. They're, they're very timid spiders actually. You, you can see these. They're, they're impressive, certainly Steatoda nobilis, this one with the, the more sort of crown-like pattern on its abdomen. 
very big spider. Looks like a grape at times. A small grape, admittedly. Uh, they come out at night, they sit on their tangled webs, but as soon as you touch that web, they're straight back into the recess. They're, they're so scared, it's unbelievable. And yeah, they're, not, they're not going to come out and bite you, it's very unlikely. The only time they're going to bite is if they get trapped in clothing or they're physically pressed against your skin. But yeah, not one that you want to get bitten by, but I wouldn't worry greatly about it. Uh, Steatoda gross is a smaller version and they have these little white triangles generally on their abdomen so that contrasts with more extensive pattern on nobilis. You can get all dark versions so I think as they get older these are spiders that live for quite a long time they can darken up and they'll lose that pattern and they're extremely resilient spiders so they can go without food for years and they can go without water for years so you could theoretically put one of these in a jam jar with a few air holes and just leave it for two or three years with no intervention and it'd still be alive. So this is what, how they've become such good dispersers throughout the globe really. They, they secrete themselves within goods, they moved across continents, shipping, food, crates and they can establish pretty much everywhere. So Steatoda nobilis was essentially a Canary Islands Madeira species. It, that's where it evolved. It was only found there, but through the action of humans, it's been carried, I think, to South America, probably Africa there. Australia, it can almost certainly establish there. Throughout Europe, it, well, actually not the colder parts of Europe so far. It's mainly Britain that seems to have attracted this spider. It's, Presumably it came in on bananas in the Canary Islands. It's, it's been here a long time. It was sort of on the south coast back in the 1890s or thereabout, 1870s. So it's taken a while to suddenly blossom and expand throughout Britain. And possibly because we're more mobile these days and move around Britain much more, taking these spiders with us. So here's a respective distributions of the two so what was essentially a south coast spider has suddenly gone all the way up to the Orkneys now but in this day and age that could just be somebody in a car takes it up taken on an aeroplane easy only needs to be a mated female and it sets up a new colony uh see a toad of noblesse it makes a very characteristic web so this is on our back garden here um, it's made a little retreat there. The spider work, and this is a trampoline web, which I've sprayed with a little water mist to, just to show it. Oh, my dog's coming to say hello. <laughs> Sorry. Right, Pardosa. Now, this is another type of wool spider that carries its egg sac along with it. So you see this little pale egg sac here, quite a small spider really, uh, I don't know, one half centimetre leg span. And you'll get these in your garden in summer. The, the season's probably just about over now in the lowlands. Uh, generally uh, May, June is the peak period for most of the species. But from about now onwards the females are starting to die off, the males have long gone. And you'll probably just see juveniles. So if you go up into the northern Scotland, higher up in the mountains, you'll come across the spider still as adults. Right. So I showed you the sheet web that uh, Steatoda nobilis constructed. Now, here's another type of sheet web. And th this was photographed here in mid Wales on a very misty day. And you can see how the dews highlighted all these individual webs. They're, they're sort of pulled taut like little trampolines. And these are made by something called the uh, Linifia triangularis. It's one of our larger money spiders. And they're very difficult to photograph because they hang on the underside of the web. As soon as you get near them, they scuttle off deep into the bush. So 
this is one of those autumn maturing spiders so you're just about starting to see sub adults now and come august september this is when they start to become more visible and then as soon as the first frosts come they've gone so a very tight season uh, orb webs we're all familiar with a classic orb web now i couldn't get a good photograph at this time of the year because they're still sort of growing up at the moment this is one i found in the greenhouse with a dead spider in it for some reason but you can see these have got these threads that spiral around and it's only on this spiral thread that there's glue droplets and the glue droplets are strange in that they, they actually hold the silk as a sort of tangled knot sort of loose knot within the blob of glue and that's a sort of way of capturing flies without it breaking the web so as a fly hits the web it takes out the, the kinetic energy of the fly because that glue sort of allows the thread to untangle slightly and then it, it sort of tangles back in on the glue drop so really technical stuff and there's always sort of talk that spider silk is stronger than steel or a spider web made of silk as thick as a pencil could stop a jumbo jet i don't know i don't know if you could get a spider that big to make it but it just shows you how amazing this silk is and obviously people are investigating it for its amazing properties really and the spider will actually at night replace that uh, that gluey silk as well it'll go around it'll eat it all and then it'll relay down fresh silk for the next day and this one's what they call a missing sector orb web so it's not that clear in this particular image but you see this area here doesn't have any threads going there it, it's like, like someone's cut out a trivial pursuit segment and that's zygiella which is a very common spider around the window frames and if any of you have watched some of the bbc wales news reports from cardiff bay occasionally they cut to a, a camera overlooking the bay and you'll see a big spider walking across the camera now that's zygiella ex notata it obviously puts in a show once in a while and interesting and also on car wing mirrors it, it seems to favor that as well it does make it difficult to decide where to record that if it's on a car <laughs> and there's its egg sacs so this was taken earlier in the year you can see these are last year's egg sacs secreted around the window pane and these are some that have hatched early and are just starting to grow so there's an egg sac that's hatched so you can see the sort of egg shells in there those white areas and the little spidlings within so yeah one to look out for very easy and you can see throughout britain definitely under recorded it's, it's all over the place really particularly likes man-made structures sort of street furniture road signs metal telephone boxes if you can find one that sort of stuff right recording so i've given you a sort of lowdown of some of the really common spiders you get around the house now how do you actually send records off spiders to to make them count really well uh as i work at covenant i'll i'll promote the ors i think that's an excellent thing if you're based in north wales to enter your spider records because you can add a photograph and that makes it so much easier to verify a record so if you've seen an interesting spider you put you've got a tentative id but you've also attached a photo you can probably say yes definitely you're right very difficult if there's no photograph you've just got to sort of gauge that yes the habitat's right it probably is correct so go on our website the covenant website and register register yourself on the ors it's all free and it's not just spider records of course you can put any wildlife records plants fungi nice map for mapping there you can pick exactly where you saw it and you can go back and you can map your own records and all that sort of stuff so that's what i'd recommend in north wales uh, if you're one of these people that likes to rove around 
uh, mobile phone recording is fantastic for this because you're not having to go back to your computer and type it in and just take your picture using this Welsh LERC app. It'll actually tell you where you are based on the mobile phone reception, the internal GPS, and those records will feed their way into the Covenod system too. And that's great if you're recording other things, not just spiders. You can take pictures of anything you come across, plants, you name it. So that's a nice one. And those records will come to us too. So once the records are on a recording system, they'll eventually get to be seen by a county spider recorder. Uh, in North Wales, that's me. So I'll check the records, make sure uh, they're realistic, i.e. it's a spider that you'll find in the area. If there's a photo, I can check that the ID's right. And that way we can build a nice reliable data set that we can use and we can map changes in distributions and what have you. Uh, then we can pass all the spider data on to the National Spider Recording Scheme. So these maps that you've been seeing throughout the presentation are from the Spider Recording Scheme. And that way that's all spider records getting funneled into the scheme. And only then can we really appreciate national distributions. So if you look at that map, for instance, this is a very strange spider, but on a local level, you think, oh, it's really common in North Wales, but only when you see the national picture do you appreciate that it's essentially absent from Scotland and largely very rare in South East England. So this is the benefit of recording and bringing data together, really. It's, you see the bigger picture. And that's a strange spider in that you'll find it on the summit of Snowdon, but Go, go up a Scottish mountain and you can't find them. So quite why that's so restricted to the sort of northwest of Britain really. It must be some mix of humidity, uh, winter temperatures or, or thereabouts. There about. So lots of questions that we still don't know really. So the, the distribution maps are posing other questions to investigate. Okay, so recording. Yeah, we don't just record for recording's sake. It's not like train spotting or what have you. It's what we want to do is, is make these records useful. So only when we get nice national data sets can we actually review how rare things are and are they restricted to certain habitats or, or what's the conservation value of this spider that we thought was rare as opposed to one that's ubiquitous. And then th this information can be fed into these national state of nature reports. So we can say, oh, there's been a sudden decline in this species because its habitat's been damaged or something. And that's critical, really. That's fundamental of recording, really. That's why we do it. It's not just a spider thing. It's ev every recording group is doing it for this reason, I would say. So that's spider recording. 